Hi there, John Wilkinson and History Made Easier. This video is for IB students and it's going to take a look at Lenin's rise to power and the Bolshevik Revolution. So the Bolshevik Revolution. Now, we have to be very clear that the Bolshevik Revolution would not have happened without Lenin. There is no doubt that he is critically important to any explanation of the revolution. His determination, his, his vision too, and his ability to persuade and win arguments against his fellow Bolsheviks. All these things were absolutely critically important. But it wouldn't have succeeded unless the provisional government had failed. So the obvious question, why did the provisional government fail? And I think it's also important for you guys to consider whether that failure was inevitable or not. But if we go to Lenin and focus on Lenin first, I would begin with his revision of Marxism. He had argued that if a revolutionary vanguard, a dedicated party, was formed, then the liberal and socialist revolutions could be telescoped. Remember, Marx had argued that um, world history would go through set stages and that the, the liberal um, bourgeois revolution would have to be embedded and would have to reveal itself as, as, as not in the interests of, of uh, the workers before a socialist revolution uh, came about. But Lenin's argument was that this could be telescoped. It could be squeezed closer to each other uh, if a revolutionary vanguard led the way. And he argued that the peasants and the workers would follow their revolutionary leadership. And so Russia's backward context did not matter in Lenin's view. All would be resolved by this revolutionary vanguard. But he called for a democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and the peasantry. Now, democratic dictatorship is interesting. <laughs> it seems like a contradiction. Well, the dictatorship would be of the bourgeoisie and the elites, those who would lose out from the uh, revolution. But it would be democratic because it, the revolution and the dictatorship would be on behalf of the vast majority, the peasantry and the proletariat. So Lenin saw no contradiction in that at all. And when Lenin arrived back in Russia, he gave his theses, his famous April theses, and he called for four key things, an end to cooperation with other parties, all power to the Soviets, the nationalization of land, all land for the people, and he called for peace, bread, and land. Now in these theses you see both the way in which he thought power could be seized and you see his, his populism, his, his call to the people. Um, what would make Bolshevism more popular than even other socialist options? He's going to seize power by refusing 
to cooperate with other parties. He's going to make the Bolsheviks stand out, stand apart from the rest. And he is going to achieve power by gaining power first in the Soviets. Not just the Soviet in Petrograd, but the Soviets all over Russia that have been spontaneously formed uh, following the, the uh, February Revolution. And the nationalization of land obviously was going to be popular to the peasantry. And the idea of all land for the people was open enough to mean anything. Um, he knew what it meant for him. It meant uh, the collectivization of land. But for the peasantry, it could mean the seizure of land for themselves. And peace bread and land was a, was a brilliant catch-all um, policy. Everybody craved for peace, for an end to World War I. Uh, the cities were starving. They were in desperate need of bread. And the peasantry, for generation after generation, all they had wanted was land. So a brilliant catch-all populist policy. But he then prepared the Bolsheviks for class war. Lenin was very clear in his own mind that the revolution and the dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry would be violent. It would have to be violent because the, the losers, the, the bourgeoisie and the, and the elites, they were big time losers and they weren't going to take that lying down there was always going to be, eventually, violence. But he had to be flexible and pragmatic. And he had to fight his party every step of the way. Socialism often had to give way to what was happening on the ground, the, the peasants' seizure of, of, of land, the, the workers seizing control of the factories, for example, and the Bolsheviks had to accept what was possible and what was not. And you guys need to be aware of where the different policies fit. You guys need to have that sorted out in your heads before you walk into that exam hall. Where do you see uh, the ideology of the Bolsheviks in those policies? And where do you see pragmatism? But what of the provisional government? Well, something else that you guys have to have clear in your heads, that there were two revolutions taking place in February and in the months afterwards. One in the palaces of power, the, the, um, the, the, the members of the Duma fighting with the Tsar, and eventually a palace coup taking power away from the Tsar. But there was another revolution going on on the streets of Petrograd, and that's where we see the, the, the beginnings of, of, of the weakness, the inherent weakness of the provisional government. Because the provisional government was always psychologically unprepared for power. Essentially, they had power thrust upon them. Russia was in such a state, Tsarism was clearly failing, clearly had to go, and they felt obliged as, as, as loyal Russians, they really felt obliged to take over the reins of power. But it was with great reluctance, because they knew they were, they were not, um, they were not 
legally uh, holding power. They had no authority. They were unelected as a government. And so we see the Petrograd Soviet, the, the famous dual authority with the provisional government, able to feed off this, this psychological unpreparedness. We see it first in order number one, that really uh, gave the Petrograd Soviet uh, control over the, the army, at least uh, the rank and file soldiers. Also, the provisional government never won over either peasants, workers or soldiers. The peasants never trusted them. They saw the provisional government as always likely to favour the landowners. Similarly with the workers, the provisional government was always likely to, to defend property, private property. And so peasants and workers never trusted uh, the, the provisional government. And of course, it, the soldiers were made up of peasants and workers. And the soldiers saw the way in which nothing seemed to be changing at the fronts. And, and so they were never won over. But it's also important to note that the provisional government also lost the confidence of the army's high command. Hence the Kornilov affair, which was essentially uh, a right-wing attempt to, to overthrow the provisional government. And so the, the provisional government simply was not loved by anyone. Um, and so it made it easier to topple it, because who was going to defend it? Workers in the towns and cities, peasants in the countryside, as well as soldiers, repeatedly challenged the government's authority. Again, we look at the land seizures, we look at the, the takeover of factories, and we look at the, the soldiers de refusing uh, the, the orders of their officers and, and deserting, uh, returning home, first in their tens of thousands and eventually in hundreds of thousands. We see it in the strikes and demonstrations too. Um, and so increasingly uh, the, the lack of authority was, was visible. The lack of the provisional government's authority, that is, was visible. And World War I was, of course, the, co the constant context. So we have three themes now. Lenin, the failures of the provisional government, and World War I, the constant context. But nobody wanted to surrender to the Germans. It was the way in which the war was being fought that... Um, soldiers uh, balked against. So we come back to the provisional government and we see the Kerensky offensive as a big mistake. Remember my, my question, was the collapse of the provisional government uh, inevitable? Well, no it wasn't. They did um, begin life, they did uh, the, the provisional government throughout its, 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 its time in office was always up against huge problems, but it did make mistakes. And the Kerensky offensive was a mistake. So too was the provisional government's response to the Kornilov affair which left the Bolsheviks much, much more strengthened. And the delays in calling elections for a constituent assembly, though, and here we have to be fair to the provisional government, there's a major war going on. So 
those delays were inevitable, but still, it looked bad for the provisional government. It made it look as if they didn't want them to happen. And so it also weakened the provisional government. So I hope that video covered a lot of ground for you. Lenin's role, including his revision of Marxism, the struggles of the provisional government, and the context of World War I. The next video is going to look at Lenin's consolidation of power. But for now, I thank you for listening. Cheers.